Welcome to my channel, Reading Radical Feminism. This is a reading of Mary Daly's Gynecology, Chapter 1. Chapter 1, Deadly Deception, Mystification Through Myth. Quote, I wish that more people could fly into space. It would make for a lot better world. End quote. Donald K. Slayton, astronaut. Quote, I would like to take part in a flight that could continue for a long time around the Earth. End quote. Alexei Leonov, cosmonaut. Quote, a man's world, but finished. They themselves have sold it to the machines. End quote. Adrian Rich from Walking in the Dark, Diving into the Wreck. Quote, we are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas. Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless, as wind in dry grass, or feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. End quote. T.S. Eliot from The Hollow Men, The Wasteland, and Other Poems. Begin quote. Despite all the evils they wish to crush me with, I remain as steady as the three-legged cauldron. End quote. Monique Wittig, Lay Gary Ayers. Patriarchy perpetuates its deception through myth. Before considering specific myths or conglomerates of them, it is important to look briefly at language about them. On the banal level of everyday cliché, one often hears, quote, it's only a myth, or story, or fairy tale, or legend, end quote. The cliché belittles the power of myth. The child who is fed tales such as Snow White is not told that the tale itself is a poisonous apple, and the wicked queen, her mother-slash-teacher, having herself been drugged by the same deadly diet throughout her lifetime, death time, is unaware of her venomous part in the patriarchal plot. On a level that passes as, quote, sophisticated, scholars from various fields generally agree on certain components of what they perceive to be myth. Myths are said to be stories that express intuitive insights and relate the activities of gods. The mythical figures are symbols. These, it is said, open up depths of reality otherwise closed to, quote, us. It is not usually suggested that they close off depths of reality which would otherwise be open to us. Oof. The language of Mercier Eliade is fascinating. Declaring that myths are, quote, paradigmatic models, he asserts that, quote, what men do on their own initiative, what they do without a mythical model, belongs to the sphere of the profane. Hence, it is a vain and illusory activity, and in the last analysis, unreal, end quote. In case the totality of this stagnation is not evident, the following passage is explicit. Begin quote, This faithful repetition of divine models has a twofold result. One, by imitating the gods, man remains in the sacred, hence in reality. Two, by the continuous, what? <laughs> Two, by the continuous reactualization of paradigmatic divine gestures, the world is sanctified. End quote. Such lines contain the essence of the patriarchal view of myth. To participate in, quote, reality is to repeat mythical models, to reactualize them continuously. The myth masters do not admit that these paradigmatic models stage, quote, reality and program the audience to be performers of, quote, vain and illusory activity, end quote. Breaking out of the circles of vain and illusory processions requires exactly the initiative which patriarchal myth stifles and which theorists such as Eliade deplore. No one has so magnificently satirized the absurdity and horror of this deceptive repetition as Virginia Woolf. Having seen through the emperor's old clothes, she describes, quote, educated men, end quote, in their public capacity, begin, quote, Now you dress in violet, a jeweled crucifix swings on your breast. Now your soldiers are... <laughs> 
Now your shoulders are covered with lace, now furred with ermine, now you wear wigs on your heads, end quote. She observes that the ceremonies which take place when men wear such uniforms are even stranger than the uniforms themselves, that men perform the rituals always together, always in step, always in the uniform proper to the man and the occasion. Moreover, and this is crucial, the paradigmatic procession slash parade by which males act out male-centered myth is the military parade. The ceremonies with the required uniforms, decorations, gestures are all part of the deceptive, quote, sacred processions by which the patriarchal processors participate in their paradigmatic myth. Wolf spells out the fundamental clue to the meaning that is masked by the deadly deceptive processions. She ponders, begin quote, What connection is there between the sartorial splendors of the educated man and the photograph of ruined houses and dead bodies? Obviously, the connection between dress and war is not far to seek. Your finest clothes are those that you wear as soldiers, end quote. Here is the high creativity that sees interconnections between apparently disparate things. The basic march in measured body movements is a death march. The radical disease is necrophilia. Wolf's insights concerning this acting out of man-made myths are extremely important in more ways than one. First, as I have just shown, she makes explicit the meaning of the myth. Quote, ruined houses and dead bodies, end quote. Second, she gives us clues that help in deciphering the deception of patriarchal analysis of male myth when a philosopher such as Jaspers asserts that myths express, quote, intuitive insights, and when a theologian such as Tillich asserts that these, quote, open up depths of reality and of the self otherwise closed to us, end quote. They deceive us with statements that are both true and untrue at the same time. The unstated presupposition of these statements is that the myths being discussed are patriarchal myths. The patriarchal myth makers slash legitimators desperately wish that the other world would be, quote, otherwise close to us, end quote. Since the female self is the other world to the patriarchs, their intent is to close us off from our own selves, deceiving us into believing that these are the only doorways to our depths and that the fathers hold the keys. Since a radical feminist analysis reaches the point of recognizing patriarchal myths as lies in the deepest sense, as distortions of our depths, one could easily conclude that traditional definitions should be dismissed. Yet this conclusion is too simple. Wolf's analysis of the ceremonies which are the quote acting out of phallocratic myth show that they did indeed give her material for quote intuitive insights end quote and that she could use them to open up quote depths of reality end quote. Needless to say, these were not the insights intended by the myth makers and uniformed myth perpetrators, yet she did elicit insights by seeing through them. So also do women elicit insights by seeing through such obvious myths as the second birth of Athena from the head of Zeus or the birth of Eve from Adam's rib. We do this by reversing their reversals, a complex process which involves much more than swinging to a simplistic conclusion that, quote, opposites of male myths are the, quote, depths that we seek. For example, to conclude that, quote, womb envy, end quote, is the key to phallocratic deception and to fixate upon female biological fertility would be just another way of falling into the trap of demonic deception. To remain there is to stay boxed into the father's house of mirrors, merely responding to the images projected slash reflected by the possessors.
After recognizing these mirror images, hags must break through the looking glass into the other world, our world, where we can learn to see with our own eyes. In order to reverse the reversals completely, we must deal with the fact that patriarchal myths contain stolen mythic power. They are something like distorting lenses through which we can see into the background. But it is necessary to break their codes in order to use them as viewers. That is, we must see their lie in order to see their truth. We can correctly perceive patriarchal myths as reversals and pale derivatives of more ancient, more translucent myth from gynocentric civilization. We can also move ourselves from a merely chronological analysis to a chronological analysis. This frees feminist thought from the compulsion to, quote, prove at every step that each phallic myth and symbol had a precedent in gynocentric myth, which chronologically antedated it. The point is that while such historical study is extremely useful, we can, whenever necessary, rely upon our crone's clarifying logic to see through the distortions into the background that is always present in our moving, self-centering time space. As the women said in Les Guerrières, begin, quote, make an effort to remember, or failing that, invent, end quote. The first definition given in Merriam-Webster for invent is, quote, to search out or come upon, find, discover, end quote. Only after this do we come up to such definitions as, quote, to think up, end quote, and, quote, to create, end quote. Women can discover and create our myths in the process of amazing tales that are phallic. Amazing. Thus, the deception in Eliade's analysis becomes obvious, for what women who have the courage to name ourselves can do is precisely to act on our own initiative, and this is profoundly mythic. Footnote, when I speak of gynocentric myth and feminist myth-making, I do not refer to tales of reified gods and or goddesses, but to stories arising from the experiences of crones, stories which convey primary and archetypal messages about our own prehistory and about female-identified power. End footnote. From the point of view of male myth masters, this inventiveness is, quote, profane, a term which Eliade defines as, quote, vain and illusory, end quote, and which sociologists define as the sphere of, quote, routine experience and of, quote, adaptive behavior, end quote. Those caught in the circles of deceptive processions will, of course, call female myth-breaking and myth-making, quote, profane. For in fact, feminists breaking the code of distorted phallic myths are breaking the routine, the vanity, the illusions, the adaptive behavior of the death marchers caught on the wheel of their, quote, paradigms. The call to female profanity is the call to the sacred realm, our background. The term profane is derived from the Latin pro before and phantom temple. Feminist profanity is the wild realm of the sacred as it was slash is before being caged into the temple of Father Time. It is free time space. This prehistoric sacred is prior to the patriarchal sequestered quote sacred, not merely temporally, but more importantly, in range and depth. Since it is not confined within the walls of any spatial or temporal temple, it transcends the, quote, accepted dichotomies between the sacred and the profane. The feminist journey into the wildly sacred background is movement into wholeness slash integrity. It may be helpful to look further into a few of the most, quote, accepted ideas of the sacred in Western religious thought. I have already indicated that there is a generally accepted classification of the contents of human experience into two opposed categories, the sacred and the profane. This dualism is essential to the analysis of such theorists as Malinowski and Durkheim.
Essentially, the same division is affirmed in the works of Max Weber, particularly in his treatment of, quote, charisma, and of Rudolf Otto in his discussion of the holy. Um, and she does have some example texts to read from all four of those men. While there are variations among these theories, they affirm basically the same split. In rejecting rigid splits associated with the patriarchally defined categories of, quote, sacred, quote, charismatic, or, quote, the holy, I am not saying that feminist analysis makes no distinctions. I am saying that we have to be free to discover our own distinctions, refusing to be locked into these mental temples. To try to fit metapatriarchal process into these categories is attempting something analogous to fitting natural feet into foot bindings, which at first deform and later function as needed supports for contrived deformity. The point is not that the terms used by, quote, authorities are necessarily always, quote, wrong. Thus, some of the terms used by Durkheim to describe his idea of, quote, the sacred might also be chosen by a woman discovering her background, for example, the term strength-giving. However, certain points should be kept in mind, especially by women with academic, quote, backgrounds. First, such terms do not belong to Durkheim at all. We do not need such, quote, authorities for legitimation. While it may be hard to unlearn the lessons of academia, especially hard for those of us who earned, quote, honors for learning them, it is honorable to unlearn them. Second, such terms have different meanings in a gynocentric context. The strength which self-centering women find in finding our background is our own strength, which we give back to ourselves. The word strength-giving is only materially the same, only apparently the same, when used by women who name the sacred on our own authority. For the patriarchal, quote, sacred can be recognized as strength sapping by women who choose to be our own authors, authoring ourselves. I hasten to add that sometimes the words used by women to describe mythic depths discovered in self-centering slash spinning will not coincide even apparently or materially with those used by male authorities on parentheses male and parentheses myth. Thus, the term awe, G. van der Luve, and dread, Rudolf Otto, do not, I think, ring true to feminist breaking through to the profane world of our mythic reality. Furious women may be dreadful to the Holy Fathers, but our tendency is to become dreadless as we become attuned to the mature nature of patriarchal religious dread. When I use the term mythic to describe the depths of metapatriarchal self-centering slash being, I mean to convey that the dreadful selves of women who choose the wild journey participate in the source of what the pale patriarchal myths reflect distortedly. Our participation is hardly a comfortable repetition of, quote, paradigms. There is a sense of power, not of the, quote, holy other, end quote, but of the self's being. This participation is strength-giving, not in the sense of, quote, supernatural elevation, end quote, through, quote, grace, or of magic mutation through miracle drugs, but in the sense of creative unfolding of the self. Meta-patriarchal myth-amazing means repudiating saintliness and becoming wholly haggard, wholly hags. Ugh, holy, W, the first one, holy, W, H-O-L-L-Y, haggard, and holy, H-O-L-Y, hags. As such, women are, quote, holy, with a W, other, end quote, to those who are at home in the kingdom of the fathers. Dreadful women are, begin, quote, quite beyond the sphere of the usual, the intelligible, and the familiar, end quote. Indeed, women becoming, quote, holy other, unquote, are strange. Myth-living-slash-loving hags are members of the, quote, outsider's society, end quote.
the mythic wholeness slash holiness of dreadful women unmasks the estranged state of patriarchy. The state of estrangement is typified in the new art named, quote, holography, three-dimensional photography, holographs, three-dimensional pictures projected onto flat photographic plates give the illusion of wholeness. Such deceptive, quote, wholeness is patriarchal holiness. It really is the absence of self. This is flat surface existence, deceptively giving the impression of depth. When I use the term mythic to describe the background journey, I am attempting to speak of dimensions hidden by the all-pervasive, quote, holographs, which are the distorted reflections of true depth. Holographs then typify the contents of patriarchal myth. Thus, myth-breaking is breaking the projector of these illusions, discovering the realm of radiant energy where the self lives and moves. I suggest that a primary pursuit for those who wield power is and has been, since the inception of patriarchy, the manufacture of such holographs, which in turn program hollow men who ceremoniously live out the paradigmatic roles prescribed by the myth masters. Indeed, quote, the more hollow, the more hallowed, end quote, should be the father's slogan. In writing of, quote, hollow men, end quote, I am not referring specifically to males. Rather, I am using the pseudo-generic term men deliberately, for women are included in the invitation to hollowness, and insofar as they succumb, they cease to be female-identified and become purely feminine, adorable and deplorable, but never really horrible, <laughs> never dreadful. The creation, that is, the reduction of reality to holographs is affected through various means. In the following section, I will analyze an example of such reductionism from, quote, the news. Since, quote, the news on the calendar of Father Time is always really, quote, the old, and quote, new, quote, new news is old news, end quote, one could say, the fact that the example is a few years old is totally irrelevant. Handshakes in Space, a Celestial Horror Show In July 1975, a space spectacular was manufactured and described by newscasters as a, quote, technological miracle. This was the famous, quote, first international docking in space, end quote. It was, in fact, an act of international intercourse. It was, to use Jan Raymond's expression, quote, a lecherous link-up, end quote, of the American spaceship Apollo with its Russian counterpart, Soyuz, meaning Union. An official news release out of Houston, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, referring to the mating as quote, androgynous, explained that the U.S. ship played the, quote, male or active role on Thursday, July 17th, by inserting its, quote, nose into the, quote, nose of the Russian ship. To even the scores, <laughs> the crafts were, <laughs> the crafts reversed roles on Saturday, July 19th. Warming to his subject, the author of the news release declared that an earlier Apollo docking, quote, was a purely male-female arrangement, a probe that fits snugly into a receptacle, end quote. While their ships enjoyed... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, while their ships enjoyed androgynous sex in space, their astronauts and cosmonauts satisfied themselves with handshakes, the traditional symbol of brotherhood. The essential point is that despite the sex role reversals of the copulating crafts, the real bonding was all male. As one of the news releases from the Space Center at Houston put it, quote, the meaning, the meaning of the mated hands circles the globe, end quote. Male monogender bonding does indeed circle the earth, choking her in its grasp.
heeding some of the technological details of the male mating involved in that celestial spectacular can help us fathom the craven craving for pomp and splendor manifested in all patriarchal processions. The heroes, acting completely under the direction of computers, their masters, were forced to crawl from ship to ship. Upon their glorious return, they also had to crawl out. Footnote, United Press International News Release, Boston Herald American, July 22nd, 1975, described the Russian, quote, re-entry as follows, begin quote, Leonov and Kubasov, shaky with fatigue and emotion, but in good health, crawled from their bell-shaped capsule to greet recovery teams with bear hugs and smiles, end quote. The same release announced that, quote, Soviet leaders called for new space exploits, inner quote, in the name of lasting peace on Earth, end all quotes. The unintended message clearly is that lasting peace could be attained if, quote, both sides would only leave the Earth. Hmm. Funny. And footnote. Although they managed to crawl successfully, they were affronted by the noxious yellow gas emitted from their craft. In a chronic state of anxiety about loss of control over their excretory functions, they <laughs> reportedly took Lomatil tablets and anti-diarrhea medicine, quote, just as a prophylactic, end quote. The space food praised by Cosmonov. Cosmonaut Leonov, for its, quote, freshness, was in fact packaged in tubes, cans, and plastic bags, anchored to the table with elastic bands. Another footnote, an Associated Press news release printed in the Boston Globe July 18, 1975, described the astronauts and cosmonauts as, quote, gathered around a green metal table in the Soyuz for a July picnic in space, end quote. It goes on, quote, there was good food, good talk, and picture taking for the folks back home, end quote. Together with such mind-boggling euphemisms, phallic fixations filled the language of the news releases then, as now, and footnote. Such inglorious details unmask the real roles of the heroes in this technologically miraculous circling. Here, then, is a clue to the need for, quote, sartorial splendor in the, quote, processions of the sons of educated men, end quote robotized, the sons of their own machines, the processors are more controlled than controlling. Above all, they are not free. This uniformed sartorial splendor, then, space suits, priestly and judicial robes, professorial and surgical gowns, is workmen's compensation. It is pitiable consolation for the unacknowledged knowledge that the processions ultimately are nothing more significant than a computer-controlled crawl. From roboticude to roboticide, reconsidering. Where do women, quote, fit in to this space of stale male mating, this world of wedded deadlock? We are supposed to fit into the, quote, family pictures, end quote, such as those displayed by the space heroes on their craft and into the pictures shown on television and in the printed media. In the televised pictures of their return, the wives are shown smiling in frantic euphoria, perhaps with the help of modern medicine, while their masters displayed far less enthusiasm at greeting them. Women are supposed to, quote, fit in to this picture as pictures, that is, projections. Footnote, this situation is not changed at all by the fact that since the Handshakes in Space event, a few women have been appointed to fly on space shuttles of the future. An Associated Press news release published in Boston Globe January 17, 1978, announced that, quote, six women, three black men, and an Asian are among 35 candidates to fly on the nation's space shuttles in the next decade, end quote. Such tokenism functions to hide and reinforce stereotypes. The forms and functions of tokenism will be discussed throughout this book, end footnote.
At the present stage of technology, the quote presence, that is absence of women, is represented in the form of photographs or of televised two-dimensional images. The direction of phallotechnic progress is toward the production of three-dimensional, perfectly reformed quote women, that is hollow holograms. These projections, or feminine non-women, the replacements for female selves, could of course eventually be projected in quote solid form as solid waste products of technical progress as robots. Eventually too, the quote solid substitutes could be quote flesh and blood end quote, not simply machines produced by such quote miraculous techniques as total therapy, for example, B.F. Skinner's behaviorism, transsexualism, and cloning. The march of mechanical masculinist progress is toward the elimination of female self-centering reality. Whether or not our replacements are materially, quote, hollow or, quote, solid is not the ultimate issue. These are simply different ways of describing the absence of female depth of spirit in feminine non-women conceived by male mothers. I will call this hollow slash solid depthless state robotitude. It is comparable to a term coined by Francoise de Bonne to describe the state of servitude of women in a phallocratic world, quote, feminitude, end quote. Robotitude, however, stresses the reduction of life in the state of servitude to mechanical motion. Moreover, it is not gender-specific, and thus indicates that the robot state is not restricted to women. It is not. However, the differences between male and female robotitude are crucial. Women are encouraged, that is, discouraged, to adapt to a maintenance level of cognition and behavior by all the myth masters and enforcers. The false molds or forms implanted in our minds during our first months and years of existence are comparable to the, quote, sanctifying grace, end quote, or, quote, supernatural life, end quote, believed by Catholics to be infused into the soul at baptism. The added, quote, fixes injected continually by society's mind controllers can be compared to the, quote, actual grace, end quote, which Catholics believe they receive through other sacraments. While men also receive false molds and follow-up fixes to reinforce their supernatural, that is, unnatural, state and patriarchal society, the grace slash serum injected is different. Fatherly fixes are essentially ego-inflating for men, whereas those administered to women are depressants. The stark contrast between, quote, uppers for men and, quote, downers for women can be noted in all manifestations of culture, including almost all contemporary films, with rare notable exceptions such as Harold and Maud. The depressants administered to women may be falsely experienced at times as, quote, highs, but these restrain the authentic self, pinning her down with a double cross. Simone de Beauvoir writes in The Ethics of Ambiguity that, the his- that in the history of individuals, it appears that adolescence is a time of choice. She then adds, begin, quote, doubtless, this decision can always be reconsidered, but the fact is that conversions are difficult because the world reflects back upon us a choice which is confirmed through this world which it has fashioned. Thus, a more and more rigorous circle is formed from which one is more and more unlikely to escape, end quote. This passage describes very well the situation of women surrounded by the deceptive processions suffocated by the circles of false, quote, choices which they impose. De Beauvoir names very well what real choice means. Begin, quote, to exist is to cast oneself into the world. Those who occupy themselves in restraining this original movement can be considered as sub-men, read sub-women. They have eyes and ears, but from childhood on they make themselves blind and deaf, without love and without desire, end quote. 
Women fixed on the double cross of deception are made to make themselves blind and deaf. The blindness and deafness, as well as the dumbness and encircled paralysis imposed upon them, are different from such defects in males who hold institutional power, who have restrained, quote, the original movement, end quote, towards being. For the latter, psychic cripples though they are, and however much their choices have been conditioned, have assumed the role of deceivers slash controllers. Their egos are supported, although in an ultimately self-destructive way. The quote, decision, writes de Beauvoir, can always be reconsidered. It is important to ask what this reconsidering means for women. The term consider is derived from the Latin considerare, meaning literally to observe the stars. For women to reconsider our earlier paternally prescribed tendencies, deceptively misnamed, quote, decisions, is nothing less than daring to see, name, and reach for the stars. It is reclaiming our original movement, our prehistoric questing power, which has been held down by the inner slash outer artificial ceilings slash ceilings. Ceilings as in like the roof and ceilings as in to seal, to seal something. Ceilings slash ceilings of the state of servitude. De Beauvoir writes that, quote, life is occupied in both perpetuating itself and in surpassing itself. If all it does is maintain itself, then living is only not dying, end quote. This maintenance level of, quote, only not dying, end quote, is what I am calling robotitude. The problem is to get beyond the maintenance level for, quote, a life justifies itself only if its effort to perpetuate itself is integrated into its surpassing and if this surpassing has no other limits than those which the subject assigns himself or herself, end quote. Clearly, as the handshakes in space show demonstrated, the heroes of phallotechnic society do not demonstrate any such surpassing, but only a caricature of it. Circling in their spacecraft, their womb tombs in the sky, they illustrated the paradigmatic myth of processions from womb to tomb, of separation and return, returning and returning. Women surpassing the circles of these circlers, daring to see the stars for ourselves, are casting ourselves into the world. This means breaking the castes into which we have been molded and breaking away from the caste, no E slash caste with an E, condemned to act out the roles prescribed by masculinist myth. Reconsidering the imposed choices of the past means acknowledging that a spell has been cast upon us, that we have been framed by the pictures of patriarchy, robotized by its rituals. De Beauvoir has written, begin quote, The oppressed has only one solution, to deny the harmony of that mankind from which an attempt is made to exclude him, her. In order to prevent this revolt, one of the ruses of oppression is to camouflage itself behind a natural situation, since after all, one cannot revolt against nature, end quote. Women can carry out the reconsidering process by refusing steadily to allow the fact of struggle between the sexes to be camouflaged, that is, by denying false, quote, harmony of mankind, end quote. This means living in a state of ultimate risking. Breaking away from false harmony, women begin to hear the healing harmony of hags, the cacophony of crones. It is of ultimate importance that we break out of the pictures by which we have been framed, out of the chorus into which we have been cast. Reconsidering requires roboticide, destroying the false selves. The original movement is the self's cosmic questing power. Restraining it is, quote, only not dying. Regaining it is ultimately the only thing that matters. It is hard to see slash name the fact that phallocracy reduces women to framed pictures slash holograms slash robots.
The seeing, naming of this non-being is essential to living. As Linda Bauerfaldi, a post-Christian feminist, has said, begin, quote, it's like the petific vision, end quote. Explaining her remark, she added that in her adolescence, she had always been puzzled by her Catholic instruction concerning this belief in an ultimate vision of the Christian God. For, according to Catholic teaching, it is impossible to have the petific vision in this life. She now realizes that this was a typical reversal. For a woman to see through the patriarchal God is to begin to live, finding her own divinity. Another post-Christian feminist theologian, Emily Culpepper, remarked that this seeing of women reminded her of the reversal contained in the idea of, quote, gallows humor, an expression meant to convey that there is an experience of seeing through the absurdity of everything only when one is condemned to die. This notion, she now recognizes, reversed the fact that seeing through the controlling parentheses male and parentheses myths is the beginning of living. The state of robotitude is marking time hopelessly, a pure repetition of mechanical gestures. Beginning living means that the victim sees and names the fact that the oppressor obliges her to consume her transcendence in vain, changing her into a thing. No kind of tokenism in a transcendence sapping system will free ourselves from the spell of patriarchal myth. As long as that myth or system of myths prevails, it is conceivable that there is a society comprised even of 50% female tokens, women with anatomically female bodies, but totally male-identified, male-possessed brains slash spirits. The myth slash spell itself of phallocratism must be broken. It may at first seem, quote, natural for women to reason that one can break the spell by demonstrating that, quote, achievement on male terms is natural to them. But after this is seen through, we encounter the problem of unmasking and moving beyond the mediocrity of such achievements without falling into opposing forms of mediocrity. Moreover, revolting against the tyrants of the phallotechnic world is revolting not only against their pseudo-natural, quote, life, that is, maintenance level of existence, but also against their pseudo-supernatural state, against their myths and technological miracles. Revolting hags slash crones are repudiating robotitude, which is an imposed state of idiocy, a kind of cretinism. The term cretin, according to Merriam-Webster, is derived from a French dialect term meaning, begin quote, kind of deformed idiot found in the Alps, end quote. The root of this term is the Latin Christianus, or Christian. This term was used quote, to indicate that such idiots were after all human, end quote. Revolting slash reconsidering requires deicide. Leaving the state of idiocy implies the death of the Cretan god. It also implies repudiating inclusion in the pseudo-generic, quote, after all human, end quote, condition of cretinism reconsidering is denying this false harmony breaking its bonds bounding into freedom flying fetuses mythological slash technological necrophilia a few years ago one robert byrne a 40 year old professor of criminal law at fordham university took it upon himself to represent all human fetuses between the fourth and 24th week of gestation scheduled to be aborted in new york city municipal hospitals byrne was himself represented by attorney thomas ford who made the following statement, begin, quote, The fetus might well be described as an astronaut in the uterine spaceship, end quote. As Ellen Frankfurt aptly comments, begin, quote, It takes a certain kind of imagination to assume guardianship for something lodged within another's body.
a rather acquisitive, proprietary imagination that fits right in with the conception of a woman as a spaceship and the contents of her womb as an astronaut. End quote. The astonishing burn incident and the analogy made by his attorney merit some attention for the light they throw upon the deceptions of male myth. Since an astronaut is perceived as the captain of a, quote, vessel, there is a desire to see the fetus as controlling the woman. Moreover, the image of the astronaut in a spaceship is interesting also because in this image, the, quote, captain is very much controlled by other males outside the spaceship. For example, politicians, economists, scientists, flight surgeons, engineers. This makes the analogy particularly, quote, appropriate in its perverse way, for the fetus is maintained in control of the woman by males outside, for example, politicians, legislators, priests, doctors, social workers, counselors, husbands, quote, lovers. Moreover, the analogy involves deceptively circular reasoning, making it doubly appropriate in this double-think context. For here, a biological event, the presence of the fetus in the uterus, is imaged as, quote, like, that is, imitative of, a technological event, the presence of an astronaut in a spaceship. This elicits an obvious question. Is the astronaut in the spaceship an attempt to imitate the situation of the fetus in the uterus? Elsewhere, I have shown that there is unacknowledged evidence in ethical writings on abortion of a widespread male tendency to identify with fetuses. This merits further analysis. There are clues about the source of this fetal identification syndrome, which is frequently fatal for women unable to obtain needed abortions, in Frankfurt's description of Byrne as, quote, a childless man who seeks to guard unwanted fetal tissue, end quote. Males do indeed deeply identify with, quote, unwanted fetal tissue, end quote, for they sense as their own condition the role of controller, possessor, inhabitor of women. Draining female energy, they feel, quote, fetal. Since this perpetual fetal state is fatal to the self of the eternal mother or hostess, males fear women's recognition of this real condition, which would render them infinitely, quote, unwanted. For this attraction slash need of males for a female energy, seen for what it is, is necrophilia, not in the sense of love for actual corpses, but of love for those victimized into a state of living death. Frank Furt's description of burn as, quote, childless also merits scrutiny, for it is the condition of all males to be childless, and there is evidence that this condition is experienced as disturbing to those who are obsessed with reproduction of the male self, which should not be confused with any genuine desire to care for and energize another being. Indeed, there are male authors who are very willing, perhaps too willing, to attest to the anxiety of males over their childless state. Philip Slater, for example, writes of, quote, This vulnerability of the male in the sphere of worldly immortality, which gives rise to the concept of the inner, quote, external soul and inner, quote, so prominent in magic and mythology, end quote. According to his view, a woman need not guess whether something of herself continues on in a new organism, for she can see the child emerge from her own body, begin, quote, thus, if one translates inner, quote, soul in these stories as inner, quote, that part of me which will live on after I die, and inner, quote, the woman initially holds her inner, quote, soul within herself. It is only the man who's quote, soul always resides outside of himself, end quote. Thus, quote, as men have been lamenting for centuries, his immortality is out of his own control, end quote. According to this view, then, males identify the, quote, immortal soul with biological offspring, and women should feel fortunate in their role as incubators, shells, hotels, youth hostels, 
homes, hatcheries for human souls. I have already suggested that it is dangerous for women to accept reductionist theories about the male propensity for, quote, womb envy. Thus, it should arouse suspicion that Karen Horney's, quote, womb envy theory, with which she countered Freud's proposition of, quote, penis envy, has been eagerly adopted by some liberal males, for example, Philip Slater. The problem with such a theory is that the implied criticism stops short of being a genuine feminist analysis. Hags must learn to double-double unthink, Andrew Dworkin's phrase, that is, to go past the obvious level of man-made reversals and find the underlying lie. Thus, it is a pitfall simply to reverse, quote, penis envy into, quote, womb envy, for such theories trick women into fixating upon womb, female genitalia, and breasts as our ultimately most valuable endowments, not only disparagement, but also glorification of women's procreative organs are expressions of male fixation and fetishism. These disproportionate attitudes are also demonically deceptive, inviting women to react with mere derivative fetishism instead of deriding these fixations and focusing on the real quote object of male envy, which is female creative energy in all of its dimensions. Male hatred of women expressed in such fetishized forms hides the deeper dimensions of envy, which remain unacknowledged. Thus, we hear one male say of another's, quote, project or invention, quote, that's his baby, end quote. We also hear men describe the books, papers, articles of other men as, quote, pregnant with meaning. Such deceptive expressions provide clues to the deeper levels of deception. They suggest that the procreative power which is really envied does in fact belong primarily to the realm of mind slash spirit slash creativity. Yet this envy is not necessarily a desire to be creative, but rather to draw, like fetuses, upon another's, the mother's, energy as a source. Thus, men who identify as mothers, that is, super mothers controlling biological mothers, are really protecting their fetal selves. They wish to be the fetuses slash astronauts and the super mothers slash ground commanders, but not the biological vessels slash spaceships, which they relegate to the role of controlled containers and later discard as trash. Ultimately, these two roles, male fetus and male supermother, are connected, even identical, since both roles are contingent on a parasitic relationship to women. The male, quote, mother's spiritual, quote, fecundity depends on his fetal, parentheses, fatal, fettering of the female to whom he eternally attaches himself by a male-made umbilical cord, extracting nutrients and excreting waste, as he does also with Mother Earth. The penis, of course, is both a material and symbolic instrument for the restoration and maintenance of this umbilical attachment. It is impossible to miss symptoms of this male fertility syndrome in the multiple technological, quote, creations, artificial wombs of the fathers, such as homes, hospitals, corporate offices, airplanes, spaceships, which they inhabit and control. Moreover, these male-constructed artificial wombs are ultimately more tomb-like than womb-like, manifesting the profoundly necrophilic tendencies of tenocracy. technocracy. Here, Eric Fromm's description of necrophilia is applicable, although misleading. Writing of the Futurist Manifesto 1909 of F.T. Marionetti, he states, begin, quote, Here we see the essential elements of necrophilia, worship of speed and the machine, poetry as a means of attack, glorification of war, destruction of culture, hate against women, locomotives and airplanes as living forces, end quote. And we have a footnote. 
Despite the useful insights on necrophilia offered by Fromm, he himself displays the necrophilic mother-blaming tendencies common to his profession on page 376 of this would be the anatomy of human destructiveness. He writes about, quote, the mother who is always interested in her child's sicknesses, his brackets, sick failures, his failures, Mm -hmm. and makes dark prognoses for the future. At the same time, she is unimpressed by a favorable change, end quote. After further explication, Frum makes his dark prognosis that although, quote, she does not harm the child in any obvious way, yet she may slowly strangle his joy of life, his faith in growth, and eventually she will infect him with her own necrophilious orientation, end quote. Thus, the eminent psychologist succeeds in putting the blame for necrophilic male behavior, which is harmful to women and girls in obvious as well as subtle ways, upon, quote, the mother. Of course, he does not universalize and say that all mothers infect their children, that is, sons with necrophilia, for this might be too obvious. Besides, it isn't necessary for his use of the, quote, example, triggers the mother-blaming mechanism that has already been programmed into most of his readers' minds. One such ambiguous, undocumented, quote, example is enough to let all males off the hook. And footnote. What is described here is a mechanized mechanization of life, a robotizing regression, the patriarchal pathology which exposed itself in the mid-70s in the heavenly homosexual hitching as a metapathology. But Fromm's description is deeply deceptive, for although some essential elements of necrophilia are noted, the core cause, quote, hate against women, end quote, is mentioned only as a detail on an itemized list, rather than being shown in its prior causal relationship. Woman hating is at the core of necrophilia. Thus, it was utterly appropriate that the American spacecraft in the Celestial Spectacular of 1975 was named Apollo, for Apollo was the personification of anti-matriarchy, the opponent of Earth deities. His name is said by some to have been derived from Apollonii, meaning destroy. Jane Harrison points out that he is the death dealer, most deadly of all the gods. She also shows that he is a woman hater. Moreover, Carrie Yenny Karenyi points out that Apollo's real enemy was a female creature, a dragoness named Delphine, a name connected with an old word for womb. Apollo killed her immediately after his birth. With perverse appropriateness, his temple was built at a place named Delphi, functioning as his artificial womb. Significantly, upon this temple was engraved the maxim, quote, keep woman under the rule, end quote. Although Apollo was fathered by Zeus and had a mother, Leto, Leto, he could well be described as, quote, not of woman born, end quote. Fittingly, he was born in a place of not Earth, a floating island in the sea named Delos. Fittingly, too, he encouraged matricide. Slater observes that, begin quote, the myth of Apollo seems to express an infinite process, bracket sick, of doing and undoing, of affirmation and negation of the maternal bond, end quote. The more accurate term, of course, would be procession, for this is a deadly circle. It should also be noted that the myth of Apollo functioned to legitimate male homosexuality in ancient Greece. Begin quote, Apollo had relationships with many youths, the first of whom was Hyacinthus. The summer festival Hyacinthia commemorated this relationship, end quote. 
Another scholar cites an inscription hewn on the rock wall beside the temple of Apollo Camillus on the island of Thera Santorin in the Aegean. It reads, quote, invoking the Delphic Apollo, I, Crimon, here copulated with a boy, son of Bathocles, end quote. We read that, quote, the sacred place and the name of Apollo make it plain that we are being told about a secret act steeped in solemnity and honor, end quote. Um, yeah, right. The mythic associations of the, quote, union with Apollo, end quote, displayed in the space spectacular were deceitfully manipulated. Clearly, the culture does not plan spectaculars to legitimate, quote, gay liberation, end quote. The astronauts and cosmonauts were obviously, quote, family men with, quote, family pictures. What was legitimated was male power bonding, while the erotic component of male mating was concealed and denied. The fact that the erotic component was present on a mythic level but concealed made the apparently non-erotic power bonding message more effective. While overtly promoting the oppressive ideal of the nuclear family, this space spectacular subliminally appealed to the erotic fantasies allegedly taboo in heterosexist society. This deceitful taboo titillation tactic is employed widely in patriarchal propaganda, reaching hysterical heights in the hidden messages of advertising. The products of necrophilic Apollonian male mating are, of course, the technological, quote, offspring, which pollute the heavens and the earth, since the passion of necrophiliacs is for the destruction of life, and since their attraction is to all that is dead, dying, and purely mechanical, the father's fetishized, quote, fetuses, reproductions, replicas of themselves, with which they passionately identify, are fatal for the future of this planet. Nuclear reactors and the poisons they produce, stockpiles of atomic bombs, ozone-destroying aerosol spray propellants, oil tankers, quote, designed to self-destruct in the ocean, iatrogenic medications and carcinogenic food additives, refined sugar, mind pollutants of all kinds. These are the multiple fetuses slash feces of stale male mates in love with a dead world that is ultimately co-equal and consubstantial with themselves. The excrement of Exxon is everywhere. It is ominously omnipresent. The illusion of, quote, Dionysian freedom there have, of course, been male reactions against a state of consciousness which is perceived as, quote, the tyranny of Apollo, end quote. Nietzsche expressed this reaction, and more recently it has been a theme song of some Christian theologians, such as Sam Keen, who writes, begin, quote, Western culture has become increasingly Apollonian, and the time has come when the rights of Dionysus must be reasserted. End quote. According to this view, the influence of Apollo has dominated Western theology and religious institutions, which for the most part have been identified with the status quo, putting their weight behind maintaining their, quote, present boundaries, end quote. Oddly, the, quote, Dionysian approach is seen by such theologians as, quote, revolution and as, quote, a radical solution. Any careful scrutiny of patriarchal Greek myth makes clear that Apollo and Dionysus are simply two faces of the same god. Thus, the proposals for, quote, revolution have the dreary resonance of a revolving door, resounding the same message. The, quote, solution consists in seeking absolution from the crime of worshipping a false god by gazing for a while at one of his other masks. What is sought is merely variety on the level of appearance, since genuinely radical change would involve the fearsome courage to cut through all the masks, facing nothing.
Since Dionysus is so commonly set up as the mystifying mythic, quote, complement of Apollo and offered as an androgynous alternative to the stereotypically rigid Apollonian masculine model, his story requires some scrutiny. Jane Harrison points out that, quote, the word Dionysus means not, quote, son of Zeus, but rather Zeus young man, i.e. Zeus in his young form, end quote. Dionysus was, in fact, in the fact of myth, his own father. To anyone aware of the meaning of Christ, aside the word incarnate and aside in Christian myth, the parallel is inescapable. Christ is believed by Christians to be the incarnation of the, quote, second person of the Trinity, end quote, and thus consubstantial with the Father. Therefore, Christ, too, pre-existed himself and was simply a later manifestation of, quote, Zeus, father, young man, end quote. Christian theologians who have been reveling in, quote, Dionysian theology will, of course, be the first to grant that Christ incorporates elements both of Apollo and of Dionysus. In glorifying the, quote, Dionysian element, end quote, they see themselves as celebrating a release from one-sidedness, from stereotypic Apollonian slash masculine rigidity as finding, quote, a dancing god, end quote. The emerging, still Christian, theology is one, quote, of the spirit, leisure, play, listening, waiting, feeling, chaos, the unconscious, end quote. All of this, of course, sounds like a description of, quote, positive aspects of stereotypic femininity. It is important that we discover the connections between apparently contradictory phenomena, namely the femininity of Dionysus, which male theologians and philosophers reacting against Apollo identify with and glorify, and the strange but familiar, quote, fact that he is his own father. G. Rachel Levy informs us that, quote, in the ritual of Dionysus, the son eclipsed the mother, end quote. Any feminist can see the ominous implications of this eclipse. In its light, that is, darkness, we can perceive the significance of the, quote, radical male return to Dionysian mask of the male god. Slater is very explicit about this, quote, solution to male identity problems. Begin, quote, what is unique about the Dionysian solution is that the maternal threat is welcomed and boundary loss actively pursued. Instead of seeking distance from or mastery over the mother, the Dionysian position incorporates her, end quote creepy. Dionysus does not have to run away from his mother or struggle against her. His victory is total. Semele, the mother of Dionysus, is the totaled woman. When she was six months pregnant, Zeus struck her with thunder and lightning, and she was consumed. Graves sums up the sequelae, begin quote, but Hermes saved her six-month son, sewed him up inside Zeus's thigh to mature there for three months longer, and in due course of time delivered him. Thus Dionysus is called, quote, twice born, or, quote, the child of the double door, end quote, end full quote. Thus Dionysus' mother was already dead long before he was born. Zeus dispenses with the woman and bears his own son, but there is more to the convoluted plot than this, for some of the myth masters held that Semele had been impregnated by drinking a potion prepared by Zeus from the, quote, heart, probably meaning phallus, of Dionysus, who had pre-existed her. According to some, he had previously been born by Persephone, who had been raped by Zeus. Thus, Dionysus is his own father, reborn and self-generated. Since he, Zeus' young man, is identified with Zeus who bore him, he is also his own mother. Thus, Semele can be seen as epitomizing the patriarchal ideal of mother as mere vessel. Moreover, the apparently contradictory aspects of Dionysus 
his self-fathering and his femininity coincide in the quote light of these elements of the Dionysian myth, we can well be suspicious of male fascination with the all too feminine Dionysus for his mythic presence foreshadows attempts to eliminate women altogether. This femininity of Dionysus should be seen also in connection with his glorification as boundary violator, as the one who drives women mad. A clue to the meaning of this maddening boundary violation is unwittingly provided by Norman O. Brown, who writes of Dionysus as, quote, the mad god who breaks down the boundaries, end quote, abolishing repression. According to Brown, quote, the soul that we call our own is not a real one. The solution to the problem of identity is get lost, end quote. This Dionysian temptation to, quote, get lost is not unfamiliar to women, whether our, quote, background has been Christianity, imported Eastern spirituality, liberated liberalism, quote, the people's struggle, end quote, straight suburban society, the orgiastic sexual avant-garde, or all of the above. This is the seductive invitation to, quote, lose the self in order to find it, end quote. Whether the loss takes place through the glorified pain of feminine Christian masochism or through the, quote, pleasurable torture of S&M rituals or through determined devotion to higher causes, the result is the same, female annihilation. Although countless women are seduced into this tragic loss of self, the fabricators of the destructive plot are male. To Dionysus was attributed the ability to shatter cognitive boundaries in women, that is, the capacity to drive women mad, which he did whenever possible. Madness is the only ecstasy offered to women by the Dionysian, quote, way. While the super-masculine Apollo overtly oppresses slash destroys with his contrived boundaries slash hierarchies slash rules slash roles, the feminine Dionysus blurs the senses, seduces, confuses his victims, drugging them into complicity, offering them his, quote, heart as a love pollution that, um, uh, love potion, <laughs> love potion that poisons. The rituals of romantic love, as well as those of religion, draw women into the, quote, ecstasy of self-loss, the madness which is literally standing outside ourselves, being beside ourselves. In contrast to this, radical feminist ecstasy is self-centering moving beyond the boundaries of the father's foreground. This is finding the self. Indeed, we break the credibility of the contrived Apollonian boundaries, such as the false divisions of, quote, fields of knowledge and the splits between, quote, mind and, quote, heart. But in this process, we do not become swallowed up in male-centered or Dionysian confusion. Hags find and define our own boundaries, our own definitions. Radical feminist living, quote, on the boundary, end quote, means this moving, self-centering, boundary definition. As we move, we mark out our own territory. The Dionysian solution for women, which is violation of our hagocratic boundaries, is the final solution. To succumb to this seductive invitation is to become incorporated into the mystical body of maledom, that is, to become, quote, living, dead women, forever pumping our own blood into the heavenly head, giving head to the holy host, losing our heads. The demonic power of Dionysian deception hinges on this invitation to incorporation slash assimilation, resulting in inability to draw our own lines. To accept this invitation is to become unhinged, dismembered. Refusing is essential to the process of the self's remembering, refusing.
The madness, which is the Dionysian final solution for women, is confusion, inability to distinguish the female self and her process from the male-made masquerade. Dionysus sometimes assumed a girl-like form. Footnote. Uh, Janice Raymond discusses in the transsexual empire the phenomenon of male to constructed female transsexuals who claim to be, quote, lesbian feminists, end quote. Although the majority of men who, quote, become women, end quote, act out the feminine stereotype, a significant minority does invade the feminist community. Like the eunuchs of all periods of history, they gain access to women's private spaces and secret meetings, appearing innocuous because of their castration. End footnote. The phenomenon of the drag queen dramatically demonstrates such boundary violation. Like whites playing, quote, blackface, he incorporates the oppressed role without being incorporated in it. In the phenomenon of transsexualism, the incorporation slash confusion is deeper. As ethicist Janice Raymond has pointed out, the majority of transsexuals are, quote, male to female, end quote, while transsexed females basically function as tokens and are used by the rulers of the transsexual empire to hide the real nature of the game. In transsexualism, males put on, quote, female bodies, which are, in fact, pseudo-female. In a real sense, they are separated from their original mothers by the rituals of the counseling process, which usually result in, quote, discovering that the mother of the transsexual-to-be is at fault for his, quote, gender identity crisis, end quote. Footnote. On the other hand, there's the UCLA Child Gender Program funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, where the mothers of boys who display feminine behavior are trained to retrain their sons, thus, quote, preventing them from becoming transvestites, transsexuals, and or effeminate homosexuals. So basically, they're going to blame the woman the mother for the gender identity crisis because the mother went to the professional, the gender professional, who told them to train their boys out of effeminate behavior, thus making the boys have gender crises and needing to go back to the gender program as adults to become transsexuals or something. I don't know. Gender's dumb. <laughs> End footnote. These, quote, patients are reborn from males. As Linda Barufaldi suggested, this fact was symbolized in the renaming of the renowned transsexual of tennis, Rene, literally reborn, Richards, whose original first name was Richard. The rebirthing male supermothers include psychiatrists, surgeons, hormone therapists, and other cooperating professionals. The surgeons and hormone therapists of the transsexual kingdom in their effort to give birth, can be said to produce feminine persons. They cannot produce women. Um, and she has a footnote. Male to constructed female transsexuals cannot menstruate. They lack clitorises. They cannot give birth. They require continual hormone fixes. They are without female history and background. And footnote. Mary Daly is a turf, is a turf. And we love to see the turviness. The seduction of women, including feminists, into confusion by Dionysian boundary violation happens under a variety of circumstances. A common element seems to be an invitation to, quote, freedom. The feminine Dionysian male guru or therapist invites women to spiritual or sexual liberation at the cost of loss of self and male-dictated behavior. Male propagation of the idea that men, too, are feminine, particularly through feminine behavior by males, distracts attention from the fact that femininity is a man-made construct, having essentially nothing to do with femaleness. 
the seductive preachers of androgyny of, quote, human liberation, end quote, dwell upon this theme of blending. When they put on the mask of Dionysus, the myth masters play the role of mix masters, quote, mixing up the victim, end quote, is the name of their mime. The illusion of Dionysian freedom then drives women into madness, as defined by honor more, M-A-D-ness is male approval desire. She writes, quote, M-A-D is the filter through which we're pressed to see ourselves. If we don't, we don't get published, sold, or exhibited. I blame none of us for not challenging it, except not challenging it may drive us mad, end quote. It is true that the Apollonian mask of God drives women into madness, but this is the madness of one who sees the face-slash-mask of the destroyer and who desires his approval because she knows she needs this in order to not be raped, maimed, starved to death, imprisoned, murdered. This is a clear-headed M-A-D-ness, but the Dionysian method is to break the boundaries that make such methods in our madness possible. Dionysus, the, quote, gentleman, merry mind poisoner, kills women softly. Male approval desire, under his direction, lacks a sense of distance from the possessor. The Dionysian M.A.D. woman desires the approval of her god because she loves him as herself. She and he, after all, are two in one flesh. She and he are of one mind. She has lost herself in his house of mirrors, and she does not know whose face she sees in her beatific visions. Thus, Dionysus drives women mad with his femininity, which appears to be a relief from the stern masculinity of Apollo. Karenyi points out that Dionysus, quote, was called Pseudonor, inner quote, the man without true virility, and inner quote, not to speak of all his joke names, such as Ginnis, quote, the womanish, or Arsnotholus, in her quote, the man womanly, and all quotes. Thus is the ultimately deceptive glorification of femininity, convincing women that it is desirable for men and also desired by them, luring females into forgetting the falseness of femininity, blinding us to the fact that femininity is quintessentially a male attribute. Boundary violation and the Frankenstein phenomenon. The most basic and paradigmatic form of boundary violation is, of course, rape. Patriarchy as the religion of rapism legitimates all kinds of boundary violation. It blesses the invasion of privacy, for example, by such governmental agencies as the FBI and the CIA, christening this invasion intelligence. It extends its blessing also to the violation of life itself by scientifically, quote, created pollution by the metastasizing of a carcinogenic environment epitomized in the ever-expanding cities of the dying and by the hideous weapons of modern warfare. The creators of artificial death belong to the same funereal fraternity as the various male supermothers, creators of artificial life and manipulators of existing life. As boundary violators, all participate in the mythic paradigm of rapism. All march in the same funeral procession, and the knowledge they share in common is mortuary science. Mary Shelley displayed prophetic insight when she wrote Frankenstein, foretelling the technological father's fusion of male mother miming and necrophilia in a boundary violation that ultimately points toward the total elimination of women. Her main character, Dr. Frankenstein, expressed a bizarre necrophilic, quote, maternal instinct, end quote, in making the monster, whom he later repudiated, fled from in terror, and was destroyed by in agony. Unable to be a, quote, mother or creator, the mad scientist in the story constructs his, quote, child from parts of corpses. 
While in the process of making his monster, he muses about his project, begin, quote, A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might in the process of time renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption, end quote. Mary Shelley here unmasks the mentality of the technological, quote, parent, for it is precisely the case that no mere father could realistically claim the right to such gratitude as that desired by the, quote, single parent, monster maker, the scientific sire. Dr. Frankenstein's inordinate wish for such gratitude is a symptom of the, quote, external soul, end quote, syndrome discussed earlier. For such gratitude would imply perpetual indebtedness of the creature for the gift of life itself and, quote, prove that the monster maker possessed an animating force or, quote, soul. This character illustrates the hysteria of the manic mother mimer who experiences his inherent male sterility as unbearable barrenness. Today, the Frankenstein phenomenon is omnipresent not only in religious myths, but in its offspring, phallocratic technology. The insane desire for power, the madness of boundary violation, is the mark of necrophiliacs who sense the lack of soul-slash-spirit-slash-life-loving principle with themselves and therefore try to invade and kill off all spirit, substituting conglomerates of corpses. This necrophilic invasion slash elimination takes a variety of forms. Transsexualism is an example of male surgical siring, which invades the female world with substitutes. Male mother genetic engineering is an attempt to, quote, create without women. The projected manufacture by men of artificial wombs, of cyborgs, which will be part flesh, part robot, of clones, all are manifestations of phallotechnic boundary violation. So also the behaviorism of B.F. Skinner and, quote, physical control of the mind, end quote, through the use of implanted electrodes by such scientists as Delgado are variations of monstrous male, quote, motherhood. Having implanted electrodes in the brain of his, quote, child, that is, brain child, the master mother has it firmly tied to his electronic apron strings. The list can be extended to include other master mothers, such as physicians and surgeons, especially in gynecology and obstetrics and in neurosurgery, psychiatrists, therapists, and counselors of all kinds. The pseudo-creative power of boundary violation, the Dionysian specialty, is clearly an invasion of women's bodies slash spirits and of all our own kind, earth, air, fire, water, this is real violation slash invasion and requires that hags make ourselves impermeable to the invaders' violations and exorcise the effects of their presence. Our understanding is often muddied, however, by the patriarchal propensity to erect artificial boundaries, the Apollonian specialty, and then to, quote, violate these as, quote, enemy territory. Wars among nations, corporations, administrations belong to this category of invasion and defense. This sort of, quote, violation belongs to the arena of boys' games and essentially has nothing to do with women's priorities. Yet countless women are in fact killed, maimed, and raped in these war games, and the energy of millions more is sapped and diverted by loyalty to one quote side or the other of these idiotic battles. The adequate response of furious women is a refusal to be tricked into pouring our energies into false loyalties.
Our sane surviving requires seeing through male-made, maddening, artificial boundaries, as well as deriding male, quote, violation of these false boundaries. Furious women will refuse to follow the man-made model of Dionysus' sister, Athena, the brainchild of Zeus, who is obsessed with abetting and supporting the battles of the boys. For we can see that she is M.A.D. with male approval desire. Since the twice-born Athena is now legion, having been reproduced over and over by Xerox cloning or conditioning, she may not be able to feel her true condition, as did Dr. Frankenstein's monster in Mary Shelley's tale. She may not be able to feel wretched, helpless, alone, and abhorred, quote, apparently united by no link to any other being in existence, end quote. Since she is a self-suffocating shell, a figment of her bizarre father's imagination, she hides depth from the self. But behind the foreground of false selves, the father's favorites, there is the deep background where the great hags live and work, hacking off with our dreadful double axes the Athena shells designed to stifle ourselves. Predictably, the smothering mother men of the Apollo and Dionysus Club will try to graft back onto our psyches the Athena parts hacked off by hags. Our hope lies in our power to know what these prostheses, prostheses and cosmetics really are. The artificial faces, limbs, conditioned responses are dead matter molded into quote lifelike imitations of women labeled quote the real thing end quote. It is essential that we be aware of the shifting methods of the ghoulish gynecologists, these sons of Frankenstein, whose specialty is quote the science of womankind end quote. That's it for chapter one. Thanks for listening. If you like my reading, please like and subscribe for chapter two.